got all the way up to about 6th or 7th, and Snyder see me coming, and he jumped to the outside because he wanted to beat me to the front. I went between him and the car and the bomb, and I went on, I want it. Well, and Frankie waited on me, you know, like, well, where I'm from, when you wait on somebody, you usually get lined up pretty good. But I lined him up and down the back of the way and blasted him, and, but I did it and knocked the field tank about half out of the car. And, <laughs> so that's my first night at Middletown. In the 1970s, we saw a wave of movements defining our nation. The fight for equality competed with the Watergate scandal, the energy crisis, and the ongoing Vietnam War for the world's attention. The average annual income was $9,400, an AMC Gremlin was a little less than $1,900, and a gallon of gas cost just 36 cents. The Dallas Cowboys appeared a record-setting five times in the Super Bowl during the 70s and became known as America's team. America's love of racing continued to grow at the Orange County track. Driver Will Kegel, paralleling the Cowboys' success, made a name for himself, winning the first five races of the decade. When I started going as far as memorable drivers, Will Cagle was winning everything. When I was a kid, the legacy of Will Cagle in Orange County Fair Speedway was unbelievable. I remember beating Will Cagle. I might have even run into him a few times, but maybe he ran into me. He was right on my bumper the whole race. It's one of the hardest races I've ever driven. Matter of fact, that's the hardest race I've ever, <laughs> I believe I've ever ran. Cagle always wanted new vehicles and everything the best. You know, back in the day when we first started, the more different it could be, the cooler it was. As long as it wasn't outside of a written rule, you were allowed to do it. Back then, you could disassemble a car and build it how you wanted within the rules, and that was uh, interesting. Yeah, every car is painted a different color. They all have a different number on them, and each driver, each builder had their own characteristics about the car. Things were evolving pretty quickly. That evolution was starting to become a more custom customized, purpose-built, dirt modified. We were getting away from what they called the coupes and coaches. That was the 30s era that they started with in the 50s and 60s. Now you're allowed to run Vegas and Pintos and Chevettes and, and some Gremlins. Gremlin for 1978. Easy to handle and the look of the times. The Gremlin was the car of choice because it had the flip on the roof, you get a little bit of downforce on the roof, and it was just a very easy body to make into a modified. As the cars saw a changing of the times, so did the history books when Beverly Pierce made an appearance as the first female driver. What I remember on a regular basis is Beverly Pierce from Newburgh, New York. She was the first female to compete regularly. And be the first female against all these boys, it's great. Back in the day, like females weren't even allowed to be in the pit area, and it was a lot harder for females to be involved in racing and get opportunities in racing. As a father to a young girl, I'm glad that there's girls that my daughter Lily can look up to, and if she wants to do that someday, there's inspiration for her. I applaud them because there is kind of a natural hesitancy on people to accept female drivers. Beverly Pierce and Barbara Lewis, it wasn't easy for them, and not necessarily easy now, but it's not so much a thing anymore. I mean, female racers are just competitors now. As the competition in the 70s grew, so did the list of household names who had raced many Saturday nights. In the 70s, I was racing against Carl Van Horn, Frank Schneider, uh, Rags Carter, Buzzy Rubin, Wayne Rubin, Bobby Botcher. I mean, it, oh, they were all there. Bobby Botcher was a really uh, aggressive but clean racer, and, and he won a, a pretty good percentage of the races that he ran. And uh, I think when my dad, my Uncle Gary, had him racing for him, he was really like the hot commodity then. So I was always pulling for that car. You know, I had a lot of other favorites too, but the 97's always who I wanted to win. 
And, and back in those days, I mean, you had like the Buzzy Rudermans, Gary Ballou, you know, when I was a kid, these are all the guys that I remember, the big name guys that were there. These big name drivers continued to make their way up from the South and were winning a lot of races. Buzzy invited me up north to run with him up there. Probably six to 10 of them would come up from Florida every year and that's how they made their living. The purses were probably two or three times the amount they were in Florida. The rudiments came up and then Gary Ballou. Gary was a little bit rough. <laughs> you didn't give him an inch, he would take it if you didn't give it to him, you know what I mean? Probably a little bit on the wild side I was. Maybe still a little bit, I don't know. Nobody had the nerve to drive a pink car, so that was kind of cool. He was just really aggressive and fun to watch. I was the rebel, you know, I was the new kid on the block. The question right now is, will Gary Ballou jump out in front at the beginning? Here we go, the green flag is out, and Ballou does jump into the lead in that crowd of number 112. Buzzy may have beat Gary to appear in the Northeast, and certainly had a few wins under his belt, but Hot Shoe Ballou topped Buzzy in the 1970s. I love Littletown. I, I always excelled there and run well there. Gary was much more aggressive. Buzzy was just polished. His car was immaculate. Buzzy, he was meticulous. My brother, he was smooth as glass and one of the best drivers in the world. He's the cleanest driver. He wouldn't take anybody out except maybe Gary once in a while. Gary was so good in this era, in 1977, he won the first Eastern States that he competed in, leading flag to flag the only person to accomplish this feat in the race's illustrious history. And it seemed like Baloo, you either loved him or you hate him. There was really no in between. That's what he said. He said, after the race, you either wanted to hang out with me, have a drink, have a good time, or you wanted to punch me out. We were up the 31st lap. I walked up to Gary and I said, Mr. Baloo, I'm going modified next year. And you think you're going to run over me like you've run over everybody else? I'm going to run over you just as much. Gary turned around and put his arm around me and bought me a beer and said, OK, kid, we'll go at it. My mom was a huge Gary Ballou fan, and my father loved Buzzy Rudiman. Buzzy had a great relationship with the fans. When you roll in the gate and you've seen the people and everything, that's the enjoyment part of the deal. He hasn't changed a bit, but he's still just as nice as ever. He's a good guy. Buzzy was real calm, librarian. That's what I called him, a librarian. Just laid back and easy going. Never really got excited or pissed off about much. Gary was absolutely one of my all-time heroes. When he had gotten hurt, I had wrote him a letter telling him I hope he feels better, and he sent me back a picture of a late model sign thanking me, and I've had it on my office desk forever since I opened business. Because one time we were going on the front shoot on the start of the race, and Gary slammed his brakes on him, and Buzzy flipped over the top of him. Yeah, Buzzy didn't talk to me for a while after that. That's one of the things you wake up at night thinking about sometimes. <laughs> Buzzy and Baloo may have been the talk of the town, but a young star with a bright future was quietly making noise. Of course, I remember when Brett Hearn, the 15-year-old, came in and he started tearing things up. I remember when all the, uh, the bigwig drivers were saying, who is this kid? Brett had a lot of talent, and Brett also knew what to do with his race cars. Well, I think Brett started a new era. I was no longer the new kid on the block. Cars were fast, Drivers were king, and the era of the race car rock star had begun.